since uh, the events of this summer, a lot of European Union members have realized that they can't abdicate their responsibility for rescuing people at sea. Hello everybody, this is On The Line, and this week we are taking questions about my uh, latest documentary short, which is about the uh, European migrant crisis and about the fact that tens of thousands of people are trying to cross the Mediterranean in unseaworthy and very, very dangerous boats, uh, leaving the African coast trying to reach the shores of the European Union. Um, over 2,000 people have drowned uh, this year alone trying to make the journey, but around 70,000 people have actually made it, which is a huge number. So we've had uh, people send us questions about the crisis as a whole, uh, as well as about who should actually be the person dealing with these migrants, who sh whose responsibility is it to go and rescue them. Um, we've got a few people who are on the line. Uh, Michael, could you uh, introduce us to the first caller, please? Oh, with pleasure, Simon. Uh, we've got a bunch of people on, and the first person is Rake. So let's say hi to Rake. Hi, Simon. Hey, Rake, uh, where are you calling us from? I'm from Vancouver, Canada. Okay, and what was your question? So my question is, um, as many of the countries affected by the migrant crisis are full-time EU members, should there be a stronger push within Europe for a supranational EU long-term policy on the issue rather than, say, national governments or NGOs coming up with short-term solutions? Well, I think that uh, this is a problem of the European Union, not just on this issue, but on very many issues, which is that they don't have a unified policy um, on a whole range of things, including you know, the uh, economic crisis that we saw in Greece. And by the way, Greece is another country in the European Union which is affected by this migrant problem because it's uh, on the sea, obviously. It's not far from Syria and Turkey, and a lot of the refugees from the Middle East are coming into Greece. Um, my documentary short focused on uh, a different section of the Mediterranean, uh, sort of further west in the Mediterranean, Italy and Malta, those two European Union countries are most affected uh, by the uh, boat people coming from Libya. Uh, and Italy in particular, and Malta to some extent as well, have complained that uh, the European Union as a whole isn't taking on um, its share of the burden and that most of it is falling uh, on Italy. Most of the uh, migrants uh, don't want to stay in Italy, um, so they end up, after arriving, uh, going to other countries of the EU. But there has been uh, this uh, policy for years now, um, it's called the uh, Dublin Regulations, I believe, which says that uh, a migrant or an asylum seeker uh, arriving in the European Union has to stay in the first European Union country um, that they get to, and this is disproportionately uh, in the past bird in Italy. So I think this year for the first time they've come to a kind of agreement uh, where they've on a sort of one-time basis shared out a lot of the migrants who've come over uh, this summer in particular, uh, but it's, that's not a long-term solution. And so I think to answer your question there should be a sort of a long-term policy that says that most of the EU countries or all of the EU countries should be taking you know, a proportion of the uh, asylum seekers who come in uh, because it really isn't fair if only one or two countries uh, have to share that border burden. What's the point of having a union uh, if you don't share each other's problems, right? Exactly. Uh, well, that brings me to my second question, actually. With the ongoing austerity measures, like you mentioned, in Greece and in the other Eurozone countries, can national governments afford to fund and these um, search and rescue missions in the Mediterranean? And is that something that's going to be popular with EU voters? Well, I think the European Union can definitely afford the search and rescue. I don't think that's the issue. Um, you know, even Greece, having been in the headlines and having this uh, huge economic crisis, is actually still a richer country than uh, other members of the European Union, um, you know, that have come into the European Union more recently, like some of the Eastern European members in the Baltic states. Um, so I think the amount of money it costs to patrol the sea, uh, you know, I, wouldn't, I won't say it's negligible and I won't say it's cheap, but a military is something that countries fund well. Um, and so, you know, the militaries have the money. What they haven't had uh, for a while is the political will of their governments to actually send those ships out to do the search and rescue. I think uh, they tried to dress it up as an economic issue. 
um, but in fact it was really a political issue. And that's actually begun to change because a lot of uh, the uh, nation states in the European Union have actually uh, sent patrols out to the part of the Mediterranean Sea that you need to patrol in order to be able to save migrants. Because keep in mind, um, you know, border patrol missions uh, that uh, the European Union has fielded in the past, you know, generally hug the European coast. They don't hug the African coast. But if you hug the European coast, then you're basically in the wrong area uh, to actually save people's lives because most of the dinghies and the wooden boats um, that get sent out uh, by the traffickers who are, you know, taking money from the migrants and asylum seekers um, don't even have enough fuel to reach Malta or Lampedusa and they go adrift sort of three quarters of the way and if the boats aren't out there to pick them up, uh, then those people in a lot of cases will end up dying. Like uh, last week, there was a case of a boat with 200 people uh, capsizing. And I think um, you know, maybe 25 uh, of those people actually drowned. But uh, there was a boat on the way uh, that rescued the rest of them. In fact, the capsizing was caused by the boat approaching um, because a lot of people rushed to one side of the boat when they saw it and flipped it over. And that's part of the problem with having um, non-professional search and rescue operations going out um, because they don't know that you need to approach uh, the boats from the stern, you know, from the front or from the back in order so that the boat can't be tipped over. And previously, before the European Union uh, was doing these rescues in force, uh, it was up to commercial vessels that were in the area. Uh, according to the laws of the sea to do the rescues. Because if you receive a distress call uh, on the open sea, then you're required to go and help that ship out. But these giant tankers or cargo ships or whatever they were, you know, they, they're not trained to do these kinds of rescues. So you have a building as tall as like a, a sorry, a ship as tall as a building floating up to a, a little dinghy. Everybody rushes over to one side, the boat flips over. Back in April, uh, that caused about, you know, a thousand, April, May, about 1,200 people to drown. So, um, you know, you need professional people doing this. Okay. And that brings me to, uh, my, to my last question. If we see the migrant crisis as kind of a symptom of the larger issues in the region in North Africa and the Middle East, do you think that European aid would be better spent investing in those countries to better the economic prospects? Is that something that you see happening? Yeah, so a lot of people have been talking about the pull factor, which is, uh, a good economy and a great life comparatively in the European Union uh, for these people coming from the Middle East and Africa, which is um, for the, mostly for the Africans, it's an economic situation and for the um, uh, Middle Easterners, it's the security situation, which is referred to as the push factor, which isn't really being addressed. Um, and I, I think a lot of people are calling for it to be addressed because yes, if you improve the conditions in Eritrea or in Nigeria, uh, or, you know, in Syria, then that would mean that a lot of people wouldn't be leaving their homes to come to the European Union. But I think, you know, saying fixing, <laughs> fixing an entire continent, an entire region is easier said than done. So, yes, you know, we need to do something about um, what's happening in Africa and the Middle East. But rather than saying we need to do something, I think people should ought to, you know, pr propose something specific rather than just say, hey, let's fix everything. You know, you can't just say, let's fix everything and go about it. You have to actually have something concrete. So for now, I think um, we can expect these people to continue coming because I don't think the uh, security conditions of the Middle East are going to be changed any time in the near future. OK, thank you, Simon. Hey, thanks for the question. Yeah, and Rake, thanks for coming on. So. Uh, Simon, we've, we're getting a bunch of tweets, and we're going to keep watching for tweets while we're live. Uh, but I want you to take a look at this one that we just got from Ryan Milstein. So Ryan wants to know um, if you think that uh, European con Union countries should really be blamed for not uh, dealing with the situation more appropriately. I mean, where does the blame lie in this, and, and what do you think about the whole crisis? Like, what's the root of it? That's a tough question to answer. I mean, I don't know if blame is really the issue here. I think the issue is the humanitarian crisis at hand because the European governments are kind of between a rock and a hard place or having to choose between um, two situations that are you know, bad, one maybe worse than the other. The first being the more um, migrants that you accept, 
the angrier your electorates get because uh, immigration just isn't popular. Um, the second choice they have is to just let people drown in the sea and that's when blame comes into play and that's when the European Union uh, countries get blamed for people drowning in the sea because we see it happening and they're not doing anything about it. Um, if you want to you know, go back even further uh, and look at what caused the uh, turmoil uh, in the Middle East and uh, North Africa, you know, we could probably trace it all the way back to the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. But maybe it's not the U.S. invasion specifically that caused the um, uh, instability, but let's say you know, the policies of dismantling um, Iraq's uh, military and you know, setting all those people uh, adrift who now are actually active members in ISIS, right? So um, that's you know, one of the causes of instability. The United States, the European Union to some extent, especially the UK, um, were major uh, players in the uh, Iraq war. So you know, maybe it is their fault to some extent. I don't know. Well, that's a, a good answer to a difficult question, Simon. Um, so speaking of difficult questions, I'm sure Chris, who's on Skype, has some uh, challenging ones for you. Let's say to Chris. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Hi, Simon, good. Um, Simon, my question alludes to something you just talked about just there. Um, in the past few years, we've seen a rise in popularity of far-right and Eurosceptic parties across Europe, um, much of it due to their anti-immigration policies. Given that, aren't European governments in kind of a no-win situation? Because um, if they do accept more migrants, they're ostensibly giving these parties a political stick to beat them with and pushing their electorate uh, towards those parties. Well, I think you're the only caller we have today who's actually in the European Union. So let me ask you, I mean, what, what do you see happening in the UK uh, specifically? Well, given, uh, given how popular UKIP are, I believe that the main parties, the uh, Labour and the Conservatives, I believe that they take their lead on immigration from UKIP. So in the past few years, we've seen Labour, who would normally take maybe a more liberal approach to to immigration, they've taken a much more, much harder one. And I mean, the kind of the irony of it is, is that the government is talking about how they're experiencing growth, how there are 750,000 vacancies, a near record high. And yet the UK, which has always been reliant upon um, foreign labor, is taking far less migrants than, say, countries like Sweden or Germany. Yeah, um, and I think the one thing that people aren't addressing, I mean, like, let's face it, a lot of the uh, right-wing politicians have a point when they say that some of these uh, migrants aren't uh, genuine asylum seekers and it just amounts to illegal migration. And, um, you know, when, when these boats are being rescued, they're not just being rescued, they're also, you know, helping the traffickers who try to bring them across the Mediterranean to the European Union to some extent, and that's something that needs to be considered. So um, with that in mind and with the anger that it engenders in mind, uh, there have been a few um, proposals put forward about uh, how to deal with that because, you know, according to international law, according to the uh, refugee um, agreement that, you know, most UN members have signed up to, uh, people who live in a dangerous place have a right to try to seek asylum in a safer place. Uh, so what do you do to allow those people to exercise that right? One thing they've proposed is to build, uh, um, you know, centers where people on the African uh, continent or in the Middle East, say in Jordan somewhere, uh, where people would be able to safely uh, line up and register and make their asylum claim without having to make the dangerous journey uh, across the Mediterranean, uh, which, you know, the Europeans don't want to have to deal with on the one hand and which is very dangerous for the people themselves who are trying to do it. So that might be one way of at least reducing uh, the flow of people coming across and giving genuine asylum seekers um, a chance to, uh, you know, exercise their, their right as an asylum seeker, as a refugee. Um, but as far as the political, you know, ramifications, I think there's been a swing to the right um, in a lot of European countries, and I don't think that 
a lot of those politicians actually care what the real effect uh, of the immigration is on the economy uh, or what the real numbers are. Uh, you know, no matter how low or high immigration is, uh, they will find a way of, uh, you know, putting up that scarecrow and using it for their political purposes. Because even if there wasn't this, this migrant crisis now on the Mediterranean, you'd have um, UKIP, uh, for example, arguing against the high numbers of uh, European Union member states, uh, citizens, coming to the UK, you know, from the Baltics or from Poland. That's been going on for decades and it's got nothing to do um, with, the, with the anger they're expressing over the migrants coming from the Middle East and Africa. So if it's not one thing for them, it's going to be the other, right? Yeah. I mean, does the migrant crisis possibly pose a greater threat to the fracturing of Europe than the economic crisis? Because, I mean, if you do get a situation where, um, say, uh, Jobnik in Hungary or the National Front in France or the Freedom Party in the Netherlands, I mean, if these parties come to power, surely the European project is untenable, uh, much more so than, say, if Greece left the euro. Potentially. I mean, who knows what the consequences could be. On the other hand, you know, when parties come to power, they have to change their uh, policies and they're not, they, they get bound by um, the agreements that their country has made in the past and uh, I think it usually has a tempering effect. So uh, I don't think anybody wants to see radical right parties come to power except for radical right people. Um, uh, but uh, if they did, maybe they wouldn't be as bad as people make them out to be. Who knows? Um, yeah, that's about as much as I have. All right. <laughs> All Thanks, right, Chris. Chris. Um, let's see what else we got. Michael, yeah. you got anything for us? Yes, yeah, so I've got a bunch of stuff for you. So let's, Edward said in a tweet that I want to take a look at. Let's talk a little bit more specifically about MOAS. Um, Edwards wants to know, what's the difference in technology between uh, some of these private rescue ships like the MOAS boat that you were on and some of the Coast Guard boats? So, you know, um, not just the technology, but what, what's the difference between a private rescue and a, a, a government-funded rescue? Well, I think the difference, the primary difference between the um, private boats is that, you know, they're just refitted. Uh, fishing trawlers or um, you know, recreational boats, whereas the naval boats are, are purpose-made purpose um, military vehicles. But I, you know, it's not really a question of what kind of a boat it is so much as what kind of training the people on board have. And um, MOAS, which is the uh, Migrant Offshore Aid Station, as it's called, is an NGO that was fi founded by a uh, Louisiana millionaire. Um, who bought a shipping trawler in Virginia and decided to bring it out to the Mediterranean to do these kinds of rescues. Um, his or, he's had a lot of uh, experience, I think, uh, in, in doing this sort of stuff, and he hired um, you know, members of the Maltese uh, military who were involved in search and rescue operations in the past. So I think they're quite prepared. But I think you know, earlier this summer there was an issue uh, with there not being enough boats out in the sea um, because the Italians had canceled their search and rescue program based on the fact that the European Union didn't want to help them fund it and they were kind of angry about that so they just axed the whole thing and then thereafter according to Amnesty International about a thousand seven hundred people drowned and I think um, those accidents on the one hand and uh, the activism of groups like MOAS bringing attention you know, bringing journalists like us uh, to the Mediterranean, uh, embedding other journalists on their ship, um, uh, got the European Union's attention and the world's attention and made them have to bring out um, these boats, these uh, actual proper naval ships, to participate. And now there's a pretty effective uh, rescue operation happening in the south of the Mediterranean Sea along the Libyan coast. But even it isn't enough because, as I said before, as I said earlier, you know, just a, a week ago, there was an accident in which uh, 200 people uh, went overboard. So um, these, these uh, crossings are still very, very dangerous, even with rescue ships out there. Cool. Well, I hope that answers your question, Edwards. Um, Simon, we got some more people on Skype. Why don't we say hey to Jennifer? Hey, Jennifer. Hi, Simon. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Where are you calling us from? Great. Tucson, Arizona. 
Oh yeah, okay, so what's your question? Um, having been on the front line of this crisis and given the gravity of the situation and the EU's stance on its accountability, do you feel at this point it's more productive to push exclusively for private involvement, private NGOs, private organizations, rather than official aid and support? And what kind of lobbying is going on right now on behalf of these migrant rights on the part of these private organizations to the EU? And how's it being taken by the EU? So there's a number of private organizations which are trying to lobby uh, the European Union and other countries to do more about the crisis. Uh, primarily, that's uh, um, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Border, the medical aid char charity, which I think have two or maybe even three ships uh, that they've chartered uh, in the Mediterranean to do this work. And for them, you know, when we were speaking to them while we were out there, they were saying that a huge part of their mission isn't just actually rescuing people, but it's um, getting the message out that they're rescuing people so that the European Union governments will feel embarrassed, you know, that it's not them doing it. Um, and then you've got Amnesty International, which has been uh, very vocal, um, talking about uh, this problem and the need to uh, rescue people um, lost at sea. And uh, you have smaller organizations like MOAS, the one we focused on in our documentary, um, who said that what they were trying to do, again, you know, much the same way as MSF, um, was to draw attention to the issue by using their boat as a sort of fulcrum for media attention. Like, I don't know uh, if you've ever heard of the Rainbow Warrior, uh, which is a Greenpeace ship um, that was you know, very famous in the 70s and 80s for you know, rocking up to whaling ships or protesting um, uh, nuclear weapons and so forth. Um, but it generated a lot of media attention because people could come on board, they could hang out with the crew, um, they could go out on these adventures which lent themselves to great narrative and great storytelling. And I think MOAS is trying to replicate some of that experience so that it has an outsized influence to the, relative to the number of people they actually rescue. Um, because you've got uh, about 70,000 people who have been uh, rescued at sea by the uh, EU navies and MOAS, and about 5,000 of those have been uh, rescued by MOAS itself. Um, but most of the media attention has been showered on MOAS because they've been the ones inviting journalists on board week in and week out. You know, when we were there, we saw a list of all of the media companies. Um, and you know, every single week or two weeks, there was a changeover of media companies that were going to be embedded. So throughout this entire store, uh, summer, you've seen stories coming out on all of the world's television channels about their work. Um, so that's you know, a very clear and present uh, form of pressure uh, through the media on, on European uh, Union governments to do something. Um, so, you know, I think it's hard for them not to do anything at this point, which is why, which is why they're, and, and Amnesty International actually said they're doing a pretty good job right now. So that's changed since the beginning of the summer. Great. And I just um, uh, was kind of curious about migrant rights once they've reached the shore safely, and if there was any active lobbying or kind of media attention on their rights post-rescue and if MOAS or any other of these private organizations do anything off the water for these migrants once they reach the shore? Well, I'm sure the, the governments do a lot for them because they've set up uh, uh, refugee centers um, and there's been a lot of criticism over the last couple of years about the conditions of these refugee centers and I think it varies on country to country, from country to country um, whether the conditions are good or not. Uh, but they've taken a lot of the Burden. Uh, Doctors Without Borders has set up some medical treatment um, in Sicily, I think, and uh, perhaps in Lampedusa, although I'm not 100% about that island. Um, so, yeah, you know, so certain facilities have been set up because you don't just drop them off on the shore and then they all wander around. No, in a, in a lot of cases, they actually get put in temporary detention. Uh, in Malta, for example, uh, some people have spent, you know, half a year to a year, some people even longer, in uh, forced detention when they arrive while their asylum um, applications are being reviewed. So, you know, it's not like you arrive in the EU and they meet you with a, with a welcome basket um, full of great stuff. Uh, it's actually, you know, people going across know that they're going to basically spend at least some time in prison. Um, in prison-like conditions when they get to the European Union. And a lot of them will get sent back as well. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Thanks, Simon. Yeah, and thank you, Jennifer, for uh, coming on. Um, Simon, we got another guy on Skype who I want you to take a, or answer some questions for. Uh, let's say hey to Matt. Hey, Matt. What's up? Oh, hey, Simon. How you doing? Royal Oak, Michigan, right? Yep, Royal Oak. How far is that from Ann Arbor? Uh, Ann Arbor, about an hour away. Which is cooler, yeah. though? Uh, I really like Ann Arbor. I like going there a lot. Me too. That's where yes. I went to high school. Very cool. Yeah. So what's cool. your question? Um, so I just had a couple questions on not specifically MOAS, but the concept of the migrant market, I guess. So I just want to know, first off, are you afraid that private individuals, not necessarily NGOs, but maybe private individuals will enter this market and maybe start mixing up families or like separate them or do anything that could possibly harm uh, children that are crossing or anything like that? Well, it kind of sounds like, you know, a scenario for an anti-utopian futuristic movie. Um, and I don't think that there's been any evidence for that because, first of all, there have been very few private companies involved in this uh, kind of initiative um, so far. Uh, and uh, right now I think MOAS is the only sort of organization that's set up by one particular individual millionaire or a couple, I should say. Um, you know, the other organization is uh, MSF, and I think that they've got people's best interests at heart, primarily. Um, and I think that since uh, the events of this summer, a lot of European Union members have realized that they can't abdicate their responsibility for rescuing people at sea. So I don't really know if it's going to be heading in that direction anymore because they've really stepped up their act. Um, so, you know, the reason that the issue of privatization came up in the first place is because uh, contractors um, did a great job of solving the uh, pirate issue off the coast of Somalia. Uh, and, and that proved to be very effective. But that was a little bit of a different situation because you were talking about um, you know, basically pirates committing criminal uh, activities, trying to steal boats and steal people, kidnap people. Um, and so there could be a, a, a active military response um, that could be effective, whereas this is a bit of a different situation where you've got a humanitarian crisis where you're not necessarily trying to attack the boats, you're trying to tr save the people on the boats. So, you know, how the private sector would fit in there um, is a little bit more of a question. Uh, it's not entirely clear. So, so far, the private organizations have been involved by, like I said before, drawing attention to the issue and by also saving a significant num number of people's lives. Um, but whether this is going to be something that the European Union is going to con actually contract out to people, um, I think you know they'd like to see funding from the European Union so that they could s expand their operations. But I think so far the governments have been uh, reluctant to actually uh, go in that direction. All right. Um, another question I had was just the concept of: Do you believe that these? Uh, do you see in the foreseeable future? the governments and the private sector working together to train these private sector people, because you referenced earlier in the program that some private sectors or some passing ships don't necessarily know the correct techniques to save these people, which is causing deaths. So do you believe that there's going to be any government private sector cooperation to have the least amount of deaths in the Mediterranean? Well, if you're going to be talking, if, if we're talking about the commercial ships, which you know are cruising the Mediterranean every day, going from the Suez Canal out to the Atlantic Ocean, um, that's such a mixed group of uh, ships from all across the world, from everywhere to Vietnam, China, you name it, to like you know African American, South American boats, that I don't think you can train every ship in, in this specific kind of search and rescue. Um, so I think you know, what activists have been pushing for is, that's why the activists have been pushing for the governments to actually do it. Um, and so that it's not left up to commercial vessels, because let's face it, you're not going to be able to ever train all of them to do it right. And in fact, one thing that's been happening on the Mediterranean is that when a distress signal is uh, sent out, which happens quite often, then a lot of the ship captains uh, in the area turn their transponders off so that they disappear from the uh, 
radar map or you know the map of all the ships that are cruising the Mediterranean um, so that the authorities can't ask them to go and rescue because they don't want to um, lose a day of their travel time um, for a rescue, be taken off course and have to then you know take these people to Sicily or wherever um, to dump them there. Uh, so the commercial ships themselves are reluctant to participate in this and I think uh, you know from their perspective they would see it as an international problem and they would say hey we pay taxes our companies pay taxes in our countries um, you know that's what the Navy and the Coast Guard is for it's up to them to do it all right that's uh, disheartening but true so thank you yep, yep that's you're welcome thank you. I think uh, that's all of our callers am I correct Simon you are right you're good at this okay. so uh, thanks for joining the show today Simon um, anything you want to say to the people at home before we uh, sign off yeah, so if you haven't seen the documentary we've been talking about for the last half an hour, um, it's called The Smartest Guy in the Sea. Uh, log on to vicenews.com and scroll down until you see a picture of a little boat in the sea. Click on that and watch it and get with the program. See you later. The EU has already picked up 65,000 people out of the sea over the course of the summer. In the sun, in the sun, in the sun. Moaz has rescued far fewer people, about 5,000 this year. But it's played an important role in getting the message out about the crisis. And until the turmoil in the Middle East and Africa ends, the crisis is likely to persist, which means that there'll be room on the high seas for activists and governments alike for a long time to come.